Hello everyone, welcome to TSAM Digital. I'm here today with Nick Silver, who's the co-founder of Climate Bonds Initiative and a member of our TSAM ESG Advisory Board. So welcome, Nick. It's great to have you. Great. It's great to be here. So before we get into the discussion, I think just to introduce yourself, do you want to tell us a little bit about your background and what you're focusing on in your work? Okay, yes. Well, by background, I'm a, a qualified actuary. I used to be many years ago a pensions actuary, um, but um, uh, I've since then spent the last sort of 20 years or so in the uh, climate finance type space and also working in um, developing countries on, on um, uh, their pension social security systems and sort of trying to extend them to, um, to reach out to uh, informal workers and poorer people. Excellent. So in terms of what you're doing now, then, because I know you've got a broad range of um, focus areas, can you tell us a bit about climate bonds today? So what sets them apart from traditional bonds in the market and what the key differences are between climate bonds and green bonds for those who don't know? Yes, yeah, sure. So um, just as background, I'm a founder chairman of Climate Bonds Initiative, which um, has been around for about 12 years. Um, uh, our our um, mission is to um, promote uh, debt finance into uh, 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 net zero um, economy, uh, climate finance solutions. Um, so um, a green bond is um, a bond where the proceeds go into um, uh, what can be considered uh, key elements of the transition to uh, a net zero economy or the net zero is a modern term, new terminology before we used to say uh, um, uh, fitting in with a low carbon economy. Okay, perfect. So can you tell us what separates green bonds from climate bonds? Because I think there's a bit um, of confusion sometimes. Yes, well, um, green bonds is a sort of generic term for the, uh, 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 and it's um, uh, uh, everything in the, a bond in the sort of uh, you know, green, a uh, wider defined space. And climate bonds is just the name of our organisation. Um, but where we're converging is uh, through this, uh, through the taxonomy. So climate bonds um, developed over a number of years, the taxonomy, which, which um, sets out the different categories of what can be considered green. So, for example, renewable energy or energy efficiency. Um, and um, we've, we've identified all the sort of possible categories which a green investment could be. Um, and this has been taken up by the EU. It's also used by... Uh, kind of not not number of other countries in effect like China and Mexico, um, and um, uh, thereby, it, so it's a kind of more formal mechanism for what can be considered a, a, a green bond. And the second element of this is that um, there's an audited trail within uh, a, a green bond, so that um, there's a, a kind of the tax only sets out what the um, what the uh, uh, investments can go into to can be considered green, but and the the uh, audited trail, if you like, is or the standard is to show that a, a method, a transparent methodology for them to to demonstrate that that's a good enough standard to be considered um, uh, a green. I hope that makes sense. So it's a sort of both a, a destination for the investment and a and, and a process. And the green bond market. General, so it started out on a quite an ad hoc basis and it's becoming more formalised so that you you, have, you you can't just issue a bond and say, I think this bond is green. It has to be you know, in line with some mechanism and the mechanisms are pretty much converging with our with our standard and with the uh, the EU taxonomy, which, which is becoming the international standard. No, that's great clarification. So thank you very much for that. So um, in terms of how they fit into your wider work, I've heard that you're working on a new initiative with um, Chatham House um, called New Capital Consensus. Is that all about climate bonds or is that a whole different project altogether? Yeah, well, that, that's a whole different project. Um, and um, so, and it's a new project and it kind of follows on from a book I wrote a few years ago called Finance, Society and Sustainability. So, and some other writings uh, I, I made. So the new climate... New Capital Consensus is a collaboration between um, Chatham House, the Institute of Actuaries, and uh, a few universities and Lan Kelly, Kelly Chase uh, Foundation. Um, and um, the kind of basic story behind my book, or the basic idea behind my book, is that the investment system um, has 
is governed by a set of rules and principles and underlying philosophy, which means it doesn't really achieve what it's supposed to do. So the investment system is supposed to provide a long term capital for the good of the economy. Uh, but actually, most investments, most long term investments are invested in secondary assets. And so they don't actually really do any any anything to the real economy. And in fact, generally, the incentives make them damaging. So they the the regulation under which things are invested make ensure that um, the, the, that that you know, assets are managed in the short term instead of the long term. Uh, they, it, it prejudice against real things like infrastructure, and it also um, means that companies, the publicly listed companies, tend to have short term incentives like paying chief executives relative to share price, and these are all damaging for what well, for predominantly for the long-term interest of the economy, full stop, but then particularly for the long-term sustainability of the economy. And so, um, you know, there's been a big move into ESG. A lot of investors say, and pension funds say, and they're concerned about ESG issues and, and are managing money on that behalf. But actually, they can only go so far. The rules of, under which they're governed mean that that you know, ESG does, doesn't really particularly do much good. And where there are rules, it's generally... Force it, for, forcing them to do, um, uh, you know, not uh, actually damage, do ha ha engage in harmful behaviour. If you look on the the macro um, scale, so the idea of new capital consensus is is to try and kind of redress this. Say, look, we need to go to net zero economy. We, we, everyone's agreed that we need sort of levelling up so investment in social, but the rules within the investment are stopping this. So how do they need to change? So that you know, investment can be made for the good of society, and not ultimately for the good of the people doing the investing. Because you know, if you invest your money, you want a return, and you can only get a return if if you're invested in a sustainable economy. So it's looking at it's taking the kind of challenge of ESG and green investment, if you like, and say, well, actually, you know, without a much more fundamental change in the way finance and investment are done, you're, we're not we're not going to get anywhere. It's just going to be don't want to call it greenwash, but it's just going to be uh, window dressing marginal behaviour activities. Some valid points there. So to take a step back then, because you mentioned about how a lot of um, investment management companies invest in secondary assets. Where do you see a lot of the capital going? I know you want to direct it to sustainable investments, but where is it currently being channeled? Uh, well, I mean, pretty much. So if you split up investment it's kind of goes into two things it goes into bonds which are mostly government bonds and uh it goes into equity it could be public or private right and you know those are that's 90 percent of investment right so equity all that does it you know if you if i i looked at i have in my pension um you know invested in some kind of esg fund, I, don't really, I looked at what's invested it's invested in it, its biggest um assets are microsoft shares microsoft and alphabet right so it, this my fund calls itself an esg fund and it's probably like every other and what does it do well it takes my money uh, my savings and it invests them for me in microsoft shares so there's not, not saying anything wrong with microsoft but microsoft don't use that money it just gets held in microsoft shares and if my fund manager decides to sell microsoft and buy alphabet then it doesn't make really make any difference to direct difference to, to the real economy so first of all we need you know to much more like impact investment and, or uh, um, where companies are using the money and the, the money's being drawn down and invested uh, properly. And so thing for me, things like uh, uh, EIS, VCT funds are actually much more valuable than, than a kind of investment in li liquid asset. Then hardly any of it goes into infrastructure, which is desperately needed. Um, and this is because of the the rules under which um, assets are managed prejudice against illiquid assets like infrastructure, whereas long-term infrastructure is a very good investment for, for a pension fund. And then there's a missing bit with, with the other half, which is mostly invested in government bonds. So if you look at, you know, we're based, we're in the UK. So the, in the UK, a half of a pension fund money gets lent back to the government effectively because the pension fund buys government bonds, which goes back to the government and what's the government do with it well it doesn't really do a very good job of it so britain has the most is the most unequal economy in the in in the eurozone um the government you know investing half a pension funds money has 
has done it in such a way as to make this really unequal society. And so there's kind of a missing bit of a sort of public-private partnerships or development bank type infrastructure. Other some countries do have this, where where there's a kind of mixture of the public and private w working together to invest in you know local er regional areas. Uh, uh, Sort of sustainable growth in, re in regional areas, which which mi mix and match the best of the public and, and private sector. Whereas at the moment we've got the worst of the private sector and worst of the public sector, if you, you like. And yeah, I, I think this fundamentally is down to the way our long-term savings are structured. Well, it looks as if we need more initiatives like yours and more <laughs> public-private partnerships to change that. But I guess it's a long-term change. Um, so. Just bring it back to what's going on in the news right now then. How do you think that this fits into the current debate about you know, rising interest rates, market inflation, and do you think that will affect asset management firms' uh, priorities when it comes to if they're going to you know, change what they're traditionally investing in versus getting involved with climate bonds or widely? You know, um, uh, it's kind of, I actually don't know the answer to that. So in the last financial crisis in 2008, um, companies... Uh, sort of went back to basics, if you like. like they, sort of, they shut down their ESG departments and stuff. And, um, uh, and, but now the, the mood is very different. Um, and so um, in a sort of crisis, um, the kind of ESG say was too much embedded within financial institutions. So I don't think they're going to change like that. I think like high interest rates, how that affects sustainable bonds or how it affects, you know, it, I have many friends who are sort of bond managers and they're in a great state of uncertainty. they have had the last 20 years of declining and no interest rates and nothing really happens. And now we've got like turmoil. And so we, I, I mean, I really don't know how this will, how this will play out on the kind of bigger picture of um, the energy transition and the war, the war in Ukraine and high, um, high energy prices. So a lot of there obviously is an argument going or debate going on at all levels about you know whether the transition to next zero is harmful to this or, or or not whether we should be reinvesting in fossil fuel and my own personal view is obviously i believe it, you've got to separate what you want to happen with what will happen right what should happen should, the should and the uh, uh the, the ought to uh, i can't think <laughs> you know what I, you know what i mean i can't think of the the, the difference here. so um so I would want us to rapidly increase the net zero transition. But actually, I think ultimately that will happen because we've got high oil prices, high energy prices. So it makes, you know, uh, renewable energy, um, uh, electric vehicles even more cost effective. And so the market is sending a signal to you know, electric vehicle manuf manufacturers to make more of them. You can't buy one at the moment and there's supply chain I I issues which need to be solved. And then on the kind of long-term energy prices, we can, we've massively rolled out renewable energy over the last 10 years and all investors have, have finally come to the conclusion that renewable energy is the way forward, green is the way forward and we're uh, disinvesting in fossil fuel. So they're kind of not going to go back to fossil fuel. They in, for the same reason it took them so long to go into renewable energy, you can't just it change your um, investment structures and go back into fossil fuel. And then you, because they, there's been a lot of disinvestment with fossil fuel or, or shutting down, you can't just sort of turn the tap on again. And if you look at, um, you know, so the German government have done a deal with the UAE, I think, to buy LNG, but the contract only starts in five years' time. You know, they, well, the contract starts now. But um, so, by which time, you, know, you can build a load, a lot of renewable energy in the next five years, and we won't need the um, oil and gas. So, so the signal, that, you know, there's sets of signals because of the high prices to do more renewables, and there's set of signals to, you know, to do more oil and gas. But I, my bet here is on the renewables because these these have already been scaled up and you know it's easier to scale something up more than to you know go back to stuff that you were get you were uh, uh, getting out of so so i'm actually i think the long term the the current inflation in energy prices etc will actually uh, um ironically speed up our green transition um but that's not given that's in my view 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, no one knows the answers, but all you can do is predict what will happen in the future and what we'll, we'll just have to watch this space to see what happens, I suppose. But really good yeah. perspective there for people to consider um, for the long term. Um, and just to sort of, uh, as closing thoughts, you know, sort of broaden it from climate bonds, when we look at, you know, the transition to the low carbon economy as a whole, are there any types of asset classes that you think that we don't talk about enough and that asset managers should really invest in more? I know you've already mentioned that there's not really a lot in infrastructure. Yeah, so it's not, uh, I mean, people do invest in infrastructure, it's not a lot. So there's there um, there's some transition bonds. So, um, and one of the criticisms of green bonds is they don't really do anything either because um, it, uh, someone can have, if you're a big oil company major, you could have a, um, you know, a renewable energy portfolio and you can sell bonds on the back of that. So it doesn't actually change you. But a transition bonds, is there are, lot, there are lots of companies which which are brown, which would do things which are high emissions, and they can't issue green bonds. What they can do is they can have a long term plan of getting out of what, what they do. So, if like a cement manufacturer or something, you know, could say, well, over ten years, I'll try and you know move my cement to another sorts of cement, which which is it, and um, that will. Uh, so that won't be a green bond, it will be a transition bond. So it's like they're issuing a set series of bonds on the back of, um, of, of a plan. And governments and municipalities can, can do that. Then there's um, uh, biodiversity um, nature-based solutions. So there's lots of talk about them. I, I get a report from someone else almost daily on my inbox, um, but I don't really see anything good, particularly good or interesting there because it's very hard. So if you've got a lot of capital, you can see building a big renewable energy um, uh, installation can absorb the capital. What what nature is much harder, right? You you can't. It doesn't need large, large investment. It needs um, country, you know, enforcement of rules generally, um, and but priority in budget in enforcing rules or more ambitious rules and targets. And so, I think we we need to develop. Um, uh, kind of mechanisms for um for uh, um investing in in nature-based solutions but then that's a wider point which comes back to work of new capital consensus uh, which is this which is you know if we think about finance and savings what we do is we 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 have a surplus of income and we put some aside into our uh, pension for example and that provides the capital for our economy and that all goes into things which are financializable and so these, these assets grow. Um, but if you look at that long term, it's slightly like Piketty's argument here. The, the economy goes biased towards things which are which you can turn into finance or you can put cash flow. On. And but that all sits on things which you can't put cash flow on things like communities and the legal system and nature. And these things are all underinvested. So there's a whole kind of uh, there's a whole kind of conversations that we have around wealth and we're saving this is our wealth but our wealth isn't just our financial assets so how do we save into these um assets which are kind of intangible um uh, and communal uh, communal assets and i think that's the really missing picture which is trying to be addressed by things like social bonds or nature bonds but i think it's like right at the beginning of the journey um of that and i hope that those that whole uh it's not even an asset class it's more a conversation about what wealth means and and what our savings go towards absolutely yeah i mean it's interesting you bring in the biodiversity point because we're actually going to have a panel discussion on um your climate change and biodiversity at tsam esg in november so oh, good. Well, I look forward to it. Up, yeah. yeah absolutely hopefully we can bring in those conversations about nature-based solutions and kind of expanding what esg means beyond the literal metrics to kind of, as you say, sort of more social impact, looking at nature holistically beyond finance. So really good points. And sadly, we don't have time to get into all of those today, but it would be great to obviously see you in person and for our audience's benefit, you'll be um, attending TSAM ESG as well. So it's been great to have you today. Um, thank you for your time. Well, it's great to be here. Thanks. I'm very much looking forward to the conference, um, Amy, and meeting you in person. So. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So we'll speak soon and thank you for joining. Thank you very much.